The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard my beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill he dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines he built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes but it yielded wild grapes let's pray together lord our song is a lament for our sin you made a way for us to be with you in the beginning and it was good but our ancestors seeing the fruit you forbade to eat did so anyway 
deciding for themselves whether it was good or bad. We have been doing the same ever since. But you sent Jesus, who resisted all temptation the accuser would bring before him. We are wild and unruly branches, but through this perfect offering, we have been grafted into the tree of life. Thank you for your mercy. Amen.
shadows and darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night The spirit you made me see forgive us, that you love us unconditionally, and that you fill us with your grace and your freedom in you, Father. Bless us as we go forth, Lord. Let us remember to stand. You have given us grace, and we are free because we are in that grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome to Creekside. Go ahead and have a seat and pay attention to the announcement. Christmas on the island of Sodor. All the engines were working very hard. Thomas and Toby were busy carrying shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child up and down the branch line. Everyone was happy. Only the coaches Clarabelle and Annie were complaining. Creeksiders only have from now until November 17th to fill shoeboxes with gifts that will be sent to children around the world this Christmas. Don't worry, said Thomas. That's still plenty of time to shop and pack the boxes. By the side of the track was a familiar figure waving to them. It's Mrs. Kindly, whistled Thomas. Mrs. Kindly was so excited for her daughter to participate in the Creekside Kids Christmas Choir with rehearsals starting November 24th at 10.05 a.m. When December 1st finally arrived, all of the engines were so excited because Creekside was now offering Sunday school classes for K through fifth graders during the nine o'clock a.m. service. Truly, this will be the most wonderful Christmas ever, peeped Thomas. Creeksiders have the opportunity to fill shoeboxes with gifts that will be sent to children around the world this Christmas. Pick up a shoebox in the Creekside lobby starting this Sunday and return the box to Creekside by November 17th. All three-year-olds through fifth graders are invited to join the Creekside Kids Christmas Choir. They will rehearse on Sunday mornings in the Student Center from 10 to 10.20 a.m. starting November 24th. Then they'll sing at both of Creekside's services on Sunday, December 22nd. Sign up at creeksidecommunity.org slash kids. Choir. We will have Sunday school classes for K through fifth graders during the 9 o'clock a.m. service beginning Sunday, December 1st. These will be identical to the 10:30 a.m. service classes, so your kids can attend the class that works best with your schedule. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. If this is your first time with us, we're so glad you're here, and we'd love to offer you a free gift of the drinkware of your choice. You can get that at the information desk after the service. If you'd like more information about Creekside or there's something you would like prayer for, please fill out the gray card in the seat back in front of you. And if you're ready to serve at Creekside, please fill out the red card in the seat back in front of you. You can drop your cards in the offering slot. Okay, let's stand up and say good morning to the people around us.
Good morning. Good to see you all. It's beginning to feel a lot like fall, isn't it, finally? Great. I'm John, one of the pastors here. What are you most thankful to God for today? What are you most thankful for? I think for me, I would say at least one of the things I'm most thankful for is fresh starts. Lots of fresh starts. Uh, just the gift of repentance. God giving me the power and the desire to turn from old habits and things that have been destroying me to live a new life. How about you? You know, if you're a different person today than when you received Christ, or even a different person today than you were a year ago, you know the gift of repentance that God gives us the ability to, to let go of the change, the things that are binding us, the things that are ruining our lives, and to go a new way. And we love stories of repentance, don't we? I mean, the stories of people who were headed toward destruction and God enabled them to turn around and live a completely different life. King David, Peter, Paul, Augustine, Martin Luther, John Newton, Chuck Colson, there's just billions of them out there. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And as long as we live in a body and a world where sin and temptation dwell, we'll need that gift, won't we? Because every day is a day to repent of something. But I found that repentance is a hard gift to receive sometimes that we resist change. We resist the unknown. And I know in my own life, I went for years hanging on to the sins that were killing me because I was afraid of what God might do if he got hold of my life. Today, as we continue in our search uh, through our study of, of the Gospel of Luke, I want to talk about the gift of repentance, and I want to talk about two things, why repent and how to repent. So, pretty simple. So, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us your word and giving us new life through your word. We want to admit again that we can't understand the scriptures unless you teach us. I pray you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to obey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at the first nine verses of Luke 13 today. Jesus has been preaching for almost three years, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. And the people love his miracles. They love listening to him, but very few of them are repenting. And so in this passage, Jesus gives them a warning about why they should repent. And I think he gives them two reasons to repent. First of all, you're in greater danger than you think. And that's verses 1 through 5. And second, the time you have to repent is shorter than you think. So let's read through this, see what we see. Now, on the same occasion... There were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. 
Apparently there had been a, a recent slaughter of some Galileans in, in, in the temple area and uh, by the Roman troops. And the, and the news spreads like wildfire throughout Israel. This is kind of local news. And so somebody asked Jesus, well, what do you think? And, and they, of course, they want to know what Jesus thinks about it. And, they, and if he's the Messiah, he should be doing something about this because the Messiah is supposed to free us from troops. But Jesus gives them a different answer than they expect. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? Jesus doesn't talk politics. Rather, he talks about what this incident in Jerusalem reveals about life in general. Do you think these Galileans deserve to die? That's the question. Don't you think that when bad things happen, whether it's the the storms in the southeast recently, or uh, school shootings, or crime, or disease, It's just human to want to figure out why did that happen. Isn't that true? Because we figure, if we can figure out why it happened to them, it can't happen to us. Because we're smarter than they are. Or maybe we're more righteous than they are. But, But Jesus says, verse three, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. More local news. Remember the other day when that tower collapsed in Jerusalem? And 18 people died. Now, do you think that those 18 people were worse sinners than you, and that's why that happened to them? Don't think that way, because unless you repent, the same thing will happen to you. Now, as Jesus is saying, unless you repent, you'll be massacred by Roman troops, or you'll have a tower fall on top of you. No, I don't think he's saying that. He's saying you're living on borrowed time. You live in a dangerous world. And whether it's tomorrow or 50 years from now, you're going to die just like they died. It's only human to look for reasons that bad things happen to other people. Isn't that true? We love to find that. I mean, if, if they knew there were tornadoes in this area of the country, they shouldn't build their house there. It's just just dumb. Or they shouldn't have been in that neighborhood at that time of night. Or, you know, if you took care of your health, these things wouldn't happen. Because if we can find a reason to blame the victim, it kind of gives us a sense of control. Gives us a sense that it can't happen to us because we're careful. Because we're smart. Now, it's probably better to be smart than dumb. And, And you can't avoid certain things that other people suffer if you make wise decisions, but it can't change the fact that we live in a dangerous world where only God can protect us and save us from the death that awaits all of us. That's that's Jesus' point here. I tell you no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Anytime I think I'm better or safer, than other people. Because I'm a better person, I'm just fooling myself. Paul says the same thing Jesus says here in in Romans 2. Look what he says. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. And we know the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Anytime I judge somebody else, Paul says, I condemn myself. Francis Schaeffer uh, 
had a great illustration. He says, suppose that when you're born, all of us are born with a little tape recorder around our neck. This was years ago, so it's, it's an old illustration. But, uh, <laughs> but the only time that tape recorder goes on is when you pass a judgment on somebody else. She's selfish. She should have shared her toys with me. Or, or I, I would never do that to somebody. I'm much better than that. Or, you know, I would never cheat on my taxes like he did, or whatever it is. So you, you have this tape recorder that's full of all the judgments you have made on other people. You die, and you stand before God at judgment, and he runs the tape recorder, and you're judged on how you judged other people. Would anybody here be innocent? No, because we condemn ourselves. The things we judge others for, we commit ourselves. And that's what Jesus is warning about, and that's what Paul is warning about here. Don't think you're that good. You do the same things they do. If they're not safe, you're not safe. I think Jesus' point here is we live in a dangerous world. Repent while you can. Repent while you can. Now, here's another question that Jesus addresses, and I need to ask. I may think I need to repent, but I just don't want to do it now. Right? I, I have plenty of time to repent. And, and first, I'm going to enjoy life. First, I'm going to earn enough to take care of my family. First, I'm going to get to the place in the corporation I want to be. Then I'll have time to repent. Then I'll serve God and be all out for him, but just not yet. Anybody ever think that way? You kind of procrastinate on repent. I should repent. I know that I'm no different than anybody else, and I, and I will repent. I, I, my intentions are complete. I will repent before I die, just not today. And that's what Jesus addresses here. Go on. I skipped a lot of verses, didn't I? <laughs> but I know you all have them memorized, so it's okay. You knew, you knew what I was saying. Okay. Let's, next, next slide. Time you have left to repent is shorter than you think. He began telling him this parable. A man had a fig tree, which he had planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, who would be his employee, Behold, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer, and if it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, cut it down. The fig tree, as, as many of you know, is often a symbol of Israel. And Jesus has been preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand for almost three years. And so in the, in the, in the parable, the owner of, of the, the vineyard says, let's get rid of this tree. We've been, we've been fertilizing it, we've been weeding, we've been watering it for three years, it still hasn't borne any fruit. It's, it's no good. And his employee says, well, let's wait another year. And, and I'll keep working on it, and if it doesn't bear fruit, then we'll cut it down and start over. And, and that's a picture of Israel, that Israel's days to repent are very limited. In fact, they won't repent. They, they crucify Jesus. And then 40 years later, the nation will be destroyed. The Romans come in. They, they destroy the temple. And all the Jews are, are cast out into all the world as a picture of their alienation from God. And Jesus says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They accept Jesus as the Messiah. What he's saying is that Israel's time to repent 
is shorter than they think. Really, the message of repent has been the same message that all the prophets in the Old Testament have been giving them, and they didn't repent then. Now Jesus is the greatest prophet, and they're still not repenting, and they're running out of time. That's, that's the point there. One reason we don't repent is we think we can, we'll repent later. Got the best of intentions. Just won't, won't do it now. When I was uh, a teenager, our church took a, a train trip from Bakersfield to Fresno because Billy Graham was appearing in, at Fresno there. And so it, that was the first Billy Graham crusade I ever went to. And, of course, he gives the invitation to come forward, and I just felt compelled. I felt like something was saying, you've got to do this. It would be wrong for you not to do this. I had no idea what I was going forward for. But I went up there, and, and the guy told me, pray this prayer. And so I prayed the prayer, and I tried to be good for three days after that. <laughs> and finally got frustrated. It was really hard being good. And so I, I just I forgot about it, and, and I thought, someday... Someday I'll come back, but not now. Not now. I got too many things in high school I want to do, and then too many things in college I want to do, and too many. I, but see, I lost interest in repentance. I was sincere at the time. I'll do it later. It's not that you can repent anytime you want to. Look what what Paul says to 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 Timothy. He says, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Why can we repent? Why can we repent? Because God enables us to repent. Notice that God must grant people the ability to repent, to come to their senses, to see reality, and to call out to God. And so Jesus is saying, do it while you can, because there's no guarantee you'll be able to do it later. Psalm 95 says, if today you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as they did at Meribah. That was when, when God promised Israel the promised land, and they said, we're not going in there, we'll get killed. And that was their chance. He said, okay, you guys will never go in there. And they wandered for 40 years until they all died and their children went in. You can't just tell God, okay, I'll listen to you later. God has to grant this. Does that make sense? So two reasons to, to, to repent. Um, first of all, you're in a more dangerous situation than you think. Any illusion of safety you have right now will be shattered eventually by disease or crime or circumstances, whatever, and you have less time than you think that you need to, if you're able to repent today, if you're able to turn to Christ, if you're able to turn your back on sin, then do it. Do it while you can, because there's no guarantee you'll be able to do it later. Does that make, that make sense? That's, that's why to repent. Okay, this is a feel-good sermon. Um, let's talk about how to repent. How, how do you repent? And I want to look at uh, the book of Revelation. Um, because in the beginning of the book of Revelation, there are seven letters to seven different churches that Jesus sends. And, and uh, in five of those seven, he says to that church, repent. Repent. He's, he's, there's something you need to stop doing. Or there's something you need to start doing. But you're killing yourself. You need to repent. And, and so repentance is kind of the theme of those letters. Repentance is for Christians, that we'll always be repenting. I want to look at the first letter, the letter to the Ephesians. It, there's some good things here about how to repent. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, now Jesus is sending, each letter is to a different church, each church is a different, has a different situation, each church has an angel or a messenger, and so the, the letter that Jesus is sending is sent to that whether it's a literal angel or it's a human leader, we don't know, but it's sent to the angel of the church. He says, the one who holds the seven stars 
in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. In each of these letters, Jesus describes himself differently, depending on the situation that church finds itself in. And here, he describes himself as, as uh, holding the stars or the leaders of, of the church, the lampstand, which is the church, walking among the lamps. He says, I am not off in heaven. I'm with you now. I'm, I'm experiencing all the things you're experiencing with you because we are in permanent union. I said I would never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you now just as you'll be with me in heaven. That's, the, that's how he's describing himself. I'm here with you guys. That's, that's what all that means. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. This is a great church, isn't it? Boy, I would love Jesus to say that about Creekside. <laughs> We're a strong church. We stand for the truth. We, we don't endure uh, heretics. We, you know, we're doing everything right. That's, that's pretty good. But, but I have this against you that you've left your first love. I have this against you. You don't love me like you used to love me. You don't seek me like you used to seek me. You're more interested in what you can do for me than in me. I have that against you. You've left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the things you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. That's a great warning, isn't it? You guys are in danger of ceasing to be a church. That's what he's saying. And we've seen this throughout history. Churches which at one time were great churches, people in love with Christ, uh, people who were doing good in the, in the community, people who were raising their children to fear Jesus, sending out missionaries everywhere, just a thriving church, which today are just a, barely a shadow of themselves. They've, they've shrunk. They're just, if there's anybody there at all, they're bickering and, and complaining there's no sense of Christ. There's no power. They, they got there different ways, but they all got there because they left their first love. They stopped serving Jesus. They stopped seeking Jesus as the most important thing in their lives. And so, uh, so Jesus is saying to the church of Ephesus, you need to repent and do the things you used to do because you love me. Now, what do we learn about repentance from that? Well, first of all, repentance begins with facing the truth. Repentance can't just be general. God, I confess I'm a sinner. Thank you for forgiving me. Let's move on. But repentance is always repenting from a specific thing. And until I name that thing, I can't repent. The Ephesians would say, you're right, Lord. We have left our first love. I, I remember the way we used to study the Bible. We couldn't get enough of the Bible. We were in the Bible every day, learning and, and enjoying. Your, now we barely open our Bibles once a week. And then we just mechanically read through it. We used to, couldn't do anything but pray. We were always praying, praying for everything because we were so dependent on you. Now we just have occasional red prayers that we, things. We used to, we used to love you. We used to love your presence. Now we just love the ministry. We love what we do for you. You, you, you got to name it. You got to say. And that's what confession is. Confession just means to agree with. So when I confess my sins to God, I am agreeing with God. I am doing this. And unless I'm specific about that, I'm not really repenting. Does that make sense? So it's specifically naming 
what I need to repent from and confessing that to God. But that's not all it is. Repentance always involves action. Do the deeds you did at first, the things you're no longer doing, because you love me then. If my behavior doesn't change, I haven't repented. Let me say that again. If my behavior doesn't change, there's no repentance. And that's where a lot of us get into trouble. I've seriously studied the Bible, in my mind, for a long time. And I've, and I've been very careful to always apply what I learned. Well, I didn't really apply it. What I did is I wrote down great applications for this Bible study in my notes. I've got years of wonderful applications in my notes. They just never got into my life. Does that sound familiar at all? Did I repent? No. No. Did I know what I need to repent of? Yeah. But I, I'll, I'll just say, Jesus, please make this true in my life. Amen. Okay, now I can move on. And I didn't realize that I have to participate in the repentance. He showed me what to do. Now I've got to respond and do something with that. Does that make sense? James warns us of this. He says, but prove yourselves what? Doers. Doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. I was a hearer. No, I am a hearer who deludes himself because I think I know what it says. Therefore, that's all I need. Prove yourselves doers of the word. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. That word looks means glances. Got the picture? You're on the way out the door, and you kind of glance at the mirror as you walk by. You don't even really see if, it, if anything's out of place, or you know, it doesn't do you any good. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Once I got my applications of my notes, I said, God, please make this true in my life. Let's move on to another study. I completely forgot about that. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Do you want to be blessed? The right answer is yes, we want to be blessed. Okay. <laughs> Middle of coaching here. Don't settle for knowing the Bible. Do what the Bible says. There is no repentance if my behavior hasn't changed. So how do I do that? Let me give you a quick, how, what's helped me in this? Paul writes, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for what? Scripture is profitable for four things, isn't it? Teaching. What's teaching? Teaching is just the lesson you learn. What did I learn from this? Okay, and a lot of people stop with teaching. Okay, I learned the lesson. No, but it's also profitable for reproof. What's reproof? Reproof is where I fall short of that lesson. If I don't see where I'm failing to live this way, I won't apply it. So I've got to take the time and look at uh, where am I failing to do this? How is that affecting my life? So it's, it's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction. What's correction? Correction is just identifying what would the goal look like? What do I want to look like? What do I want to do right? That makes sense? And I did all three of those things. I had all three of those things lined up in every Bible study I knew. Here's what I learned. Here's where I'm falling short. Here's what the correction looks like. Please make that true in my life, Jesus. Amen. I'll go study something else now. I left out number four. All Scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. 
Why do athletes train? They train so their body is in shape and able to perform the sport they're competing in. And they train to make the skills that sport requires something they just do by habit. Really, it's just practice. It's, it's like it's true in music, it's true in athletics, it's true in so many things that if you practice doing something over and over and over again, the first few times you do it, it'll feel really awkward, isn't it? But the more you do it, new habits are established. And it becomes more and more natural until finally it just becomes something you do almost without thinking. That's what training is. And the Bible is profitable for training us in righteousness. I, uh, I used to coach high school swimming. And uh, just imagine if on the, the first workout of the year, I gave them a, a thorough lecture on the right way to swim, all the skills they needed to swim well. And then not only did I do that that day, I put on my suit and I jumped in the pool and I demonstrated to them um, how to practice those skills, how, how each, each little skill was necessary to make them a fast swimmer. Is that all I need to do? Would I have a championship swim team then? Why not? Because you only learn to swim by swimming, right? Because those skills are hard, hard to develop. Just getting your body level rather than swimming like this. Learning to use your whole body to power your, rather than just your arms. Um, learning how to breathe so you don't die. Um, <laughs> It's only through practice, oh, intentional practice, that over the years you develop those skills. That's true for every sport. Improvement is slow and takes disciplined practice. That's training. And so the same thing is true if you're going to repent. You have to figure out, how am I going to practice this so it becomes part of my life? This week I was talking to a friend and I, I asked him, what are you applying in the Bible right now? And he said, I'm trying to drive like a Christian. <laughs> and that resonated with me. Because I've never put a bumper sticker on my car that identified me as a Christian because it would just bring disrepute to the name of God. And, and, I, thought, and I thought, I'm doing everything I need to do. I'm hiding. That's all God expects me to do when I drive. And, and he, I was so convicted by what my friend said, and I realized that really for most of us, it is our time in the car that is the most regular chance to practice living as a Christian, <laughs> loving my neighbor as myself, glorifying God through my good deeds, forgiving my enemies, putting other people first. It's like a time in the gym every day that you get to practice how the, living the way you want to live the rest of the time. You see the point? And he wisely saw that if I, can, if I can drive like a Christian, I can probably live like a Christian the rest of the time because I will have practiced these things. That's just, we've got to practice, to repent. You've got to practice and keep practicing it till it becomes part of you. That's the great thing about habits. We are basically a mass of habits, good habits and bad habits. And the reason you act the way you act is because it's a, it's a habit. It's the way you've always acted. And so the only a habit can cure a habit. To change your bad habits, you gotta develop new habits. That's what repentance is is you're, you're repenting by developing those new habits. So as you are convicted by God, as you read the scripture, this is something I'm not doing. This is something I'm failing in. Don't be overwhelmed by guilt. 
that's not helpful because Christ has already forgiven you. But take it, okay, this is the next thing I need to work on. What will I practice to put this? And even the little, little bit, the smallest little issue that you begin to practice, you'll feel God's blessing. You'll feel God's love. You'll feel God's nearness because you're doing something. It is the doer of the word that is blessed. Remember the story of the prodigal son? Young son, kind of a rebel, doesn't want to live at home. So he, he asks his dad to give him his share. Of the, he, nobody asked for their share of the inheritance before their father died. It just wasn't done, but he did. And his father gave it to him, and he goes out and blows it. And is, is broke and having to feed pigs. And he finally comes to his senses. And he says, you know, my father's servants are better off than I am. I'm going to go back. And so as he goes back, he makes up this little speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Please make me one of your hired men. It's better to live with his father as a hired man than it is apart from his father. His father, meanwhile, has been watching the road for ever, ever since he left, just hoping this will be the day his son comes back. And when he sees his son, he runs, throws his arms around him, and weeps. And his son begins the little speech, and the father says, bring the best robe and put it on him. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. Because my son was dead, and now he's alive. If you repent, how do you think God will react to you? Well, it's about time. <laughs> You've been a real jerk. But maybe we can make something of this ruined life anyway. Now, I've got 15 things you need to stop doing. That's kind of the way we imagine it. But remember, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. The, the son goes back to his father because he realizes, my life is so much better with my father. And that's what should motivate us to repent. My life is so much better with God, with my Father, because he's nothing but good. And if I go to him, he's not going not to criticize me. He's going to throw his arms around me and say, welcome home, and put the robe of righteousness around me. If you're far from Christ today, come back. Come back. Come to him. Throw yourself on his mercy. Say, I repent. Make me the person you want me to be. And be blessed. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the gift of repentance. It's a gift we need every day because we're a silly and stupid people. But thank you for loving us. And not only loving us, but giving us the grace to change. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
says the Lord, in repentance and rest you'll be saved, in quietness and trust is your strength. Amen. Have a good day.